it really is a lot of fun being here, and it's a real, real honor uh, and a humbling experience. Uh, it looks like this is a, uh, a really a tremendous, tremendous meeting, and I'm uh, very proud to be part of it. So uh, the title is CSF Fluid and Complications in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I wasn't quite sure if that meant to be CSF leak as a complication or complications of CSF leak. So we'll talk a little bit about both. Uh, I'm very fortunate, as I just uh, told Dr. Rutka, I work with a, a large group of physicians uh, at Cedars in Los Angeles, uh, particularly Dr. Mai and Dr. Moser, who are uh, interventional neuroradiologists who, uh, who evaluate and treat a lot of the patients we see together, and then Dr. Louis, uh, who's one of the anesthesiologists who does a lot of work on uh, blood patches and is a, a big proponent of large volume blood patches. So uh, we probably won't be talking too much about, you know, leaks from a spinal tap, but maybe if time uh, permits, we'll talk about that a little bit. We're also not going to talk about, you know, people with bad spine trauma or people who undergo surgery uh, on their back and then get a CSF leak. What we're going to talk about is uh, what, what I still call spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, it's something that's been known for quite a few years. It was really first uh, mentioned by a uh, neurologist uh, Georg Schaltenbrand in the 1930s, he described some women with typical positional headaches that you would get after a spinal tap, but they had never had a spinal tap. He did a spinal tap on them, and he found that there was no spinal fluid. And he called it a liquoria, the absence of spinal fluid. And for a while, it was called Schaltenbrand syndrome, uh, but he uh, became a Nazi collaborator, and that term is no longer used. Uh, then uh, there were some people who called it hypolicorrhea because sometimes you do a spinal tap, you do get fluid back, it just very, very slow, it just drips out of the needle uh, and the pressure is low. Uh, we usually now call it intracranial hypotension. Uh, for a while people called it CSF hypovolemia, uh, but that's a misnomer because hypovolemia means low blood volume and it has nothing to do with blood volume. It's uh, spinal, uh, spinal fluid volume. Uh, what I think is very important to realize, it has to be something that happens in your spine, right? So if you leak from your nose or your ear, CSF rhinorrhea or odorrhea, those people don't get positional headaches. Uh, very important to realize. I saw my first patient uh, with a spontaneous CSF leak in the spine back in uh, 1991. I was a resident at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. And there was a, a young woman, 22-year-old exotic dancer, who in her line of work was uh, uh, mistreated and she fell. And ever since that time, she had these terrible positional headaches. And uh, she saw a lot of neurologists there in Florida, didn't know what was wrong with her, her brain CT was normal. And then she saw Neith Folt, uh, Folger, and uh, Dr. Folger uh, was the chairman of neurology, and he said, oh, I know what you have, you have a CSF leak. Uh, did not get an MRI, he immediately got a CT myelogram. And because this is the Mayo Clinic, uh, you saw her in the morning, CT myelogram was done by one uh, in the afternoon, and we found a, a single cyst that you can see there, arrow is pointing at it. Um, and that afternoon, we took her to the operating room, so everything was done within basically 12 hours. They had never seen something like this, but that morning, we had treated a brain aneurysm uh, with an aneurysm clip, so we thought, well, let's do the same thing. We'll use an aneurysm clip. Uh, we fixed her uh, leak. Uh, and she did great, and I talked to her a few years ago, 23 years after her surgery, and she was still doing really well. Uh, so that, you know, as a, as a resident, that was really remarkable for many things. You know, one, there's this amazing neurologist who immediately makes a diagnosis. There's this amazing clinic who gets everything done within a day. And also, I had been interested in connective tissue disorders, and this lady had very hypermobile joints, uh, as you can see on the right, and we had actually submitted that picture along with the article to the Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, but Dr. Rutka's predecessor said that cannot have anything to do with a leak, so you cannot publish that picture. Maybe you can look that up, who that was, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, when did I actually see my first patient with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? So that was when I was a medical student fresh out of high school, uh, in Amsterdam in 1984, we saw this girl, 16-year-old girl, came to the ER with what was a TIA, but uh, the neurology resident said, hey, you cannot have a TIA, you're only 16, so we sent her back on the subway. Uh, there she had a stroke. 
and it turned out that she had uh, vascular uh, or type 4 uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, uh, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about spinal fluid leak. So back in 1991, that was considered to be something, you know, extremely rare. We wrote it up as a case report. Uh, but it's not that rare. There are really no good studies that would show us how common it is. But when I looked at uh, Olmsted County, Olmsted County is the only county in Minnesota without any lakes. It's where the Mayo Clinic is. There are 100,000 people who live there. And we found two people with uh, SIH. Uh, so we said prevalence must be one in 50,000. And then when I uh, came to uh, Los Angeles after a few years, we looked at everybody coming through our ER the ER at Cedars is a little bit unusual because we're far removed from any uh, major highway, so we don't see a lot of trauma, yet it's the busiest ER in LA. And uh, we keep close track of everybody who comes through, and we found that for a couple of years, that for every two patients with a ruptured aneurysm in their brain, we saw one patient with a spontaneous leak. So we said the incidence of a ruptured brain aneurysm is 10 per 100,000. Uh, so for SIH, it must be uh, five per 100,000. Of course, epidemiologists you know, laugh at that kind of data, uh, but it's really the only thing we have. Now, what about now, right? So 19, uh, 2017, is this, uh, is this something that's routinely diagnosed? So everybody in this room, you know, we all know about spontaneous intracranial hypotension, uh, but nevertheless, you know, everywhere, not in, just in Canada or Europe, also in the US, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to find the right physician for you. It's difficult to get the right treatment, uh, especially if the scan is normal. Uh, you might not even get a blood patch, or if you have one blood patch, uh, they'll say, you know, at major medical centers in the US, you cannot have your other blood patch like six or 12 months later. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, misinformation. Uh, as far as connective tissue disorders, the first 150 people I saw, uh, at, uh, at Cedars, five of them had been diagnosed with Marfan, three with Ehlers-Danlos, one with polycystic kidney disease. Uh, but then quite a few people looked like they had Marfan syndrome or it looked like they had type 3 Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. They just didn't meet uh, all the criteria. So, you know, I do think that uh, probably the majority of people with spontaneous leaks uh, have something awry with their connective tissues. Now, of course, in children, uh, it's more, so when I looked at the first 24 children, and with that I mean between the ages of 2 and 18, uh, who have uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, it's a little bit uh, more common. Uh, a lot of people uh, with uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome can do that uh, with their fingers on the right, but that uh, on the left, that's, that's difficult to do. I haven't seen too many people who can do that. Um, uh, we try to get away from any sort of, you know, invasive type of imaging, uh, and we use this a lot. Uh, it's called an MR myelogram, and that thing on the left, that's uh, spinal fluid. It's a myelogram in a normal uh, patient. Somebody, it's actually a volunteer, no leak. And uh, the ones on the right side, the five panels on the right, those are all different uh, patients with, you know, different types of uh, spinal fluid leaks or cysts. Um, so we also know that if you not specifically look at just patients with connective tissue disorders, but if you look at the whole group of patients with spontaneous intracranial hypotension, uh, a lot of them have something that you can, you know, objectively look at. So uh, David Ramoyne was a uh, geneticist at Cedars. Uh, and we looked at about 50, 60 patients with CSF leaks, and we did skin biopsies, uh, dural biopsies, and about one out of five people had these odd fibers on electron microscopy. We found aortic root dilatation in about one out of five. Uh, we found that about one out of 10 had a brain aneurysm. That's compared to one out of 100 for you know, the, the general population. So we think that genetics uh, plays a large role. Uh, yet it's rare to have a family with spontaneous CSF leaks. That really doesn't happen very often. So clearly, you know, other things must play a role. Trauma probably plays a role, right? I'm not talking about a spinal tap, but, you know, more or less trivial trauma. There seems to be a peak in spring. Uh, we found that bariatric surgery is a risk factor. Uh, I've had a few patients who got their leak after a spider bite. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, lots of other risk factors, most of them we don't know about. Um, we've been keeping, you know, very close tabs on, on everybody who I see uh, with spontaneous intracranial hypotension, and uh, we've seen uh, we've seen a thousand patients who who meet these uh, pretty strict criteria that we wrote for the International Committee for Headache Disorders. So, in order to meet the criteria, you either must have an abnormal brain MRI that clearly shows the things you see in a CSF leak. You must be able to actually see the leak on a spine scan, right? So, not just a cyst. We have to see like a big collection of fluid outside of the sac. Uh, or an opening pressure less than six uh, when you do a, a lumbar puncture. Um, the, the, the mean age of people who have this is 45, but you can see it, you know, I've seen it anywhere from age two to age 91. So you really can see it at, at any age. It's definitely more common in women, like for every man there are about two women uh, who have a CSF leak. But then when you look at the distribution, uh, among elderly patients, it's more common uh, in men, and among younger patients, uh, it's more common in women. Uh, we all know about headaches, right? And still, you know, we talk a lot about all these other more or less esoteric symptoms from a CSF leak. The vast majority of patients, at least in the beginning, start off with headache. A neck pain, with that I mean, you know, posterior neck pain or neck stiffness, very, very common, nausea, vomiting. Uh, hearing abnormalities, like, you know, feeling like muffled hearing, like you're underwater. Uh, light, noise sensitivity, all very common. A lot of these patients initially are diagnosed with migraine. Uh, and then the headache, even though, especially in the beginning, vast majority is orthostatic, right? It goes away when you lay down. Some people have the reverse. They have a large leak. They actually feel better when they're up and about. Uh, sometimes, particularly when the headache lingers for months or years, it becomes... It becomes what's known as a uh, latter half of the day headache. So in the morning, you know, people feel pretty good, but then around noon, one, two in the afternoon, that's when their uh, headache comes on. And just like you can have a wide variety in headache types or neurological symptoms, you also can have a wide variety in severity. So there are some people who have very extensive leaks and they don't know about it. It's an incidental finding on an MRI. Uh, and then there are people who with, uh, with leaks and it, and it results in uh, stroke or, or even death. Um, a lot of the uh, increase in the number of patients, of course, is uh, because MRI scans, right? And we came up with this mnemonic a few years ago, SEEPS, and it stands for subdural fluid collections. It's like subdural bleeding in the membrane uh, between the brain itself. Uh, and the dura, the, the covering of the brain enhances. Uh, that's the first E, the veins and gorge. That's the, the second E. The pituitary gland enlarges. That's the P. And then the last S is uh, sagging of the brain. Um, so what you can see here on these MRI scans, like this one shows the uh, subdural fluid collections. This uh, second one, those little arrowheads go to this white structure, those are actually veins underneath the dura. So this meningeal enhancement are actually just dilated veins in the, what's called the subdural zone. In Europe, we call that the white line. Uh, and then this is the sagging of the brain. So this whole mid part of the brain, lower part, the brain stem is all malformed. And then the lower three, you can compare those. Uh, uh, that's when it becomes normal or near normal. And what's fascinating is that even in people who've had this for 10, 20, 30 years, after treatment, and whether that's a blood patch or glue or surgery, all these things are very, very reversible. Um, I, you know, so, so some people uh, have typical symptoms of a CSF leak. They go to their physician, they get a brain MRI, and they're told, well, your brain MRI is normal, you cannot have a leak. But about one out of five people, at least of people we see, uh, have a normal brain MRI, like from the beginning to the end, always normal, and they have a large leak on their uh, spine imaging. Uh, usually what's the case is that in the beginning the MRI is abnormal, and then over time it becomes normal. Rarely it's the other way around, right? So even if you've had an MRI a year ago or two years ago that was normal and the symptoms persist, it's probably a good idea to get another MRI scan. Uh, and of course it does have to be read by somebody who knows about it, uh, so these are some people who, where that didn't happen, 
Like this patient had the pituitary gland removed. This patient had surgery for the subdural hematomas. This patient had a biopsy for the meningeal enhancement. This patient had a Chiari operation for brain sagging. Actually, had three Chiari operations because it didn't get better. And then this patient, uh, you know, this is a CT scan. Uh, there's very little spinal fluid there because the brain is sagging, but it was interpreted as brain edema, and even though the patient was wide awake, you know, the residents tried to put in little, little catheters to obtain spinal fluid. Um, like I said before, the, the MRI myelogram is really something we re rely upon. It's a totally non-invasive test, does not uh, involve a spinal tap, does not involve uh, radiation, uh, and we have really pretty much done away with CT myelography, so we don't really use it anymore. Uh, we use something else that's called uh, digital subtraction myelography, uh, and I'll show an example of that later. Uh, the intrathecal gadolinium enhanced MRI is a technique where you do a spinal tap, you inject gadolinium, you have to dilute it one to 10 because else you can get seizures. Um, and some people have reported really good results. Uh, that hasn't been the case for us. Uh, we still do it sometimes, but the yield, uh, at least when we do it, has not been very high. So this is the MR myelogram. A few years ago, I looked at uh, like some patients we saw in a, in a certain time period to see if we could determine, you know, what really are the different types of leaks. Uh, and we were able to identify three types. Uh, the first type is uh, what we call type one. So that's a leak uh, that's caused by an actual hole or a tear uh, in the dura. So these are usually people who have very extensive leaks. Uh, they're a little bit difficult to treat with blood patches or glue, so a lot of those patients end up with surgery. And then at surgery, uh, this is the spinal cord over here. This is the dura. Uh, we reflect that away from underneath the spinal cord, and then this is the hole in the dura. This is one of these digital myelograms, and that can tell you exactly where that communication is. So it's not that you have to explore over the whole uh, area where you can see the leak. So that's what we call the type 1 leak. Oftentimes those are related to little pieces of bone, as you can see there, or here under the microscope. Um, another type of, uh, of hole is when it's more behind the spinal cord. Uh, that's pretty uh, rare. Uh, the type 2 leak is uh, leaks that are caused by uh, leaking cysts. So this is somebody who has multiple cysts on the MR myelogram, the digital myelogram shows me exactly which one is leaking, uh, and then this is what that looks like under the microscope. So that's type 2. Type 2B are people oftentimes with connective tissue disorders, not Ehlers-Danlos, but different ones, uh, and their dura is really, really abnormal and dysmorphic. Uh, difficult to operate on because the dura is so fragile. And then type 3 leak is a leak we discovered just a few years ago and it's really, it's a direct communication between CSF and a blood vessel of the spine, and we call that a, a CSF venous fistula. And this is what that looks like under the microscope. It's like a little leech that's attached to the dura. The dura is over here. Type four are people where we just don't know what the cause is of their leak. Um, in the beginning, when I was a resident, for example, I operated on a few people who, uh, you want to put that tight, it's like stuck on that for a long time. Um, uh, where it looks like the leak is coming out uh, between C1 and C2, you know, we heard a lot about C1 and C2, and people still operate on that. Uh, that's not where the leak is coming from. The leak is coming from lower down in the spine, but it just travels up the, uh, the spinal canal and comes out there just because the connective tissues there are loose in general. Um, what is our, our basic treatment algorithm, right? So let's say somebody comes into the ER with a CSF leak. Uh, if it's a Friday, we usually will put them on bed rest over the weekend because unless somebody is like comatose, we don't do blood patches really on the weekend. Um, if they don't get better with bed rest, uh, you know, coffee can help, abdominal binder can help, doesn't cure the leak, of course. Then we do a blood patch. You can do, you know, many blood patches. There's no set limit uh, to how many you can do. Usually the latter ones don't work as well as the initial ones. If blood patches don't work, then the next step can be glue, if it's a leak that's suitable for glue. And if glue doesn't work, uh, then surgery. Uh, 
Uh, like I said before, we go towards a, uh, a non-invasive type of workup. That means an MRI or a CT of the brain, uh, MR myelogram. Uh, if the MRI of the brain clearly shows it's somebody with a leak, you don't really need to look at their spine. Certainly in Europe, we would just go ahead and do blood patches then. Um, but what's important to realize is that half of the patients who we know must have a leak, they have a normal spine scan, right? We just can never find the leak. We do blood patching under fluoroscopy, also not necessary, but I think it's a little safer. Uh, we've injected as little as three cc's to cure a leak, uh, and the, the most we have injected was 135 cc's. So that, you know, that of course, that looks like a lot, and you can only do that in people who have a very, very extensive leak. This is what uh, the needles look like for glue placement, so you can, you know, address several levels. Um, and then with surgery, you know, there are different ways of doing surgery. Uh, if it's one of these holes, then you can uh, suture it. If it's a, uh, a cyst, I still liking, I like doing these aneurysm clips, um, just like we did back in 1991. Uh, for these fistulas, you can clip the little uh, abnormal vein, or you can just cauterize it. That works just as well. Um, as far as the, the, the success rate, it's a little bit hard, right, because... A lot of people we see, most people are people who are otherwise, you know, haven't been able to be cured. Uh, but we actually, we see quite a few people from town as well. Uh, blood patches probably can cure 80% of patients. If that doesn't work, we don't go to glue. Uh, glue cures about 40% of patients who we cannot cure with blood patches. And then uh, for people with surgery, if you can really identify the leak, then the success rate of surgery should be uh, should be very high. If you cannot, I, I operate on a lot of patients who just have these cysts, but we don't see a leak really, then the success rate of surgery uh, is, is not that high. It's about 75%. Uh, the risk of treatment for the first 500 blood patches we did, we had two people who became paraplegic, uh, but it was just temporary. It lasted about 20 minutes, uh, and then it resolved uh, with glue. Uh, we've seen some people who get aseptic meningitis, probably because some of the glue gets into the spinal fluid. You can just treat that with uh, steroids. Uh, surgery, uh, especially people who've had prior surgery with intradural exploration, meaning you know somebody else has operated on the spinal cord, they're scarring. I've had some complications with that, that people had to go to uh, rehab for, uh, for weakness in their lower extremities. Uh, this is just an example of a lady who had you know, some of these cysts, and then after surgery I did, she had this very large uh, pseudomeningocele, and she had to have another operation to, uh, to fix that. Uh, for these patients who have very, very extensive leaks in front of the spinal cord, uh, not only are they hard to treat with blood patches, it's also difficult for the body to just uh, fix that by itself. So some people have this for literally 10, 20, 30 years. And when that happens, they can get different complications. So these are complications of a CSF leak. Um, let's see if this works. This is an example of one of these uh, digital myelograms to find these leaks in front of the spinal cord. And it's done by our uh, neuroradiologist. It's like an angiogram, but not injecting it into the blood vessel, but injecting it into the spinal fluid. Uh, this is uh, looking at it from the front. And then now you see it looking at it from the side. And then over here you see the dye coming out in front of the spinal cord. This is the front, this is the back. And then you can see how that dye goes all the way up and a little bit down the spine. So that really has made a tremendous difference for me because now it's fairly straightforward to identify uh, the exact uh, site of the leak. Now, of course, it's not always as clear as in this uh, digital myelogram. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to find. Uh, if you have these leaks for a long time, you can get something that's called superficial siderosis, where little, little blood products uh, coat the brain. Those people will have a positional headache, and 20 years later, uh, they'll develop hearing loss and trouble walking. Um, that's caused by bleeding at the site of the, of the leak. Uh, sometimes that, that spinal fluid, when it comes out of the dura, 
can cause so much pressure on the on the nerves going to your arms uh, that you can get uh, bad weakness and it looks like uh, ALS, like Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and uh, you have uh, muscle atrophy, as you can see here. And this can be very, very debilitating. This is a patient from, uh, from somewhere out of the country. Um, Let's see if this works. Anyway, he can, you know, he can hard, this is about as far as he can move his arms. Uh, if you have one of these leaks and the spinal cord uh, gets stuck to that hole, it actually can go through that hole and can cause a lot of damage to the, uh, to the spinal cord. So those will be people who had a positional headache, not treated, and then a couple of years later, they start uh, becoming uh, paraparetic. Um, and then all of those people, of course, you know, they have these, these different types of uh, ventral hole in front of their spinal cord. And they look, you know, as you can see here, they don't look identical, but they look very similar. And then sometimes when I, you know, I usually send pictures to whoever refers these patients. And then if it's somebody who refers a lot of these patients, they'll say, oh, that's just like the one I sent you two months ago. But they're actually all a little bit, a little bit different. Um, Sometimes, as you can see here, uh, we do find this herniated disc, right? So again, this is the spinal cord. This is that disc that goes through the dura. That's just a calcified disc. You can break that up in little pieces. Very easy to remove, and then you can just suture, uh, suture that hole. Sometimes those discs are a little bigger, like up here. I think this is actually a Canadian patient. Up here, this is the uh, piece of calcium. You can see that on ultrasound during surgery, here and here it's sticking. This is the spinal cord. Here it's sticking into the spinal cord. And then this is what it looks like uh, under the microscope. Um, sometimes these, these holes are right in the middle underneath the spinal cord and the dura is not very uh, lax and is, you can't really safely suture it. Then you can uh, try to just plug that hole, as you can see here, with a little piece of, uh, of muscle that works uh, just as well. Um, we've developed some different surgeries for people where, you know, we just can't make any better. There's this thing I call a dural reduction operation uh, that you can see here. So this is the dura in the lumbar spine. I remove a segment of that. It's usually about two inches uh, by about, you know, five, 10 millimeters. And then we suture it back up together again. Um, these are two, uh, identical twins from New York uh, who had that surgery done. Uh, the, one of the two sisters had had five blood patches, and then the other sister got exactly the same symptoms. She wanted to have the same surgery done, but I said, you really need to try blood patches first, but they also failed. Uh, that surgery works not that well, so uh, when I looked at that the last time, only about 60% of people uh, had a good outcome with that, so that usually means that they don't want more treatment. Uh, so that's not, not particularly high. But certainly, a lot of those patients who have this surgery don't meet the criteria, right, for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, but they have positional headaches. And this is other procedure that, that we've been doing where we implant a, a catheter in the epidural space in the spine, and I hook it up to a little porta cath that you can see here, and uh, the patient can access that portacath themselves uh, and infuse themselves with artificial spinal fluid. Uh, that's a very, very cumbersome type of treatment that I, uh, I don't really like doing because it's so cumbersome for the patient, but sometimes that's really all that works. And then